but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to, con to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. No flesh. We are the true circumcision to worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Tom, we're going to sing the hymn on the back of the bulletin. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Uh, those pink slips are for special music that Jim and Kay Recenti will do uh, after the next congregational hymn, so you might have to share those. Thank you. Good morning. I've, uh, I have to apologize. My, my speaking voice is at a baby level volume, so if I've ever been speaking too softly and you all can't hear me, I'll try to amp it up a little bit. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, please. I've been so blessed by this scripture, just it's so full and uh, complete and just really points us to Christ. And I'm hopeful that uh, the Lord blesses this this morning. Uh, verse 12. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in his ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace and that he might re reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, 
and whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, and whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Merciful Heavenly Father, Lord, and your word is perfect, and you are that word, Lord. We're thankful for you and your grace, and pray that you would be pleased to reveal yourself to us. Please open our ears to hear your message in our hearts, Lord. Cause us to believe, Lord. Increase our, unbe our belief and decrease our unbelief, Lord. Please increase our faith in you. We're sinners, Lord, and we know that you sent yourself down to save sinners. Pray that you would save us today, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together once again. We'll sing hymn number 158. 158. <clears throat> Just by way of introduction, uh, this song is, is per a bit personal to me because it's about my greatest foe, which is my depravity and my, uh, my constant habit of looking at the waves and the wind and, and getting my eyes off of Christ. And that's why I'm here today, of course, to hear the gospel and to set my eyes again and again back on Christ, to hear the gospel again and again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yet I cry and complain about the things that aren't. This is not fair. Why is this happening to me? Thou art all I need and all in all. Yet I look to myself and so I fall. Turn me and I will be turned. Have mercy on this world. Turn my eyes to Christ, the living sacrifice. Risen. 
risen Savior, sovereign over all, working good for all that thou hast called. With my eyes so blind and my heart so cold, only Christ alone can save my soul. With all my worries and all my fears, the gospel message I need to hear. Turn me and I will be turned. Have mercy on this world. Turn my eyes to Christ, the living sacrifice. Risen Savior, sovereign over all, working good for all that thou hast called. No greater power in all the earth than the power of God to remove our curse. Thou workest in the lowest of low, so all the glory to thee shall go. Turn me and I will be turned, have mercy on this worm. Turn my eyes to Christ, the living sacrifice. Risen Savior, sovereign over all, working good for all that thou hast called, working good for all that thou hast called. Thank you, Jim K. And you know, you know that all things work together for good. Them who are called according to his purpose. God has a purpose in calling out a people, and he works all things out for their salvation. Will you open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 15? Mark chapter 15. <clears throat> and then also I'd like to ask you if you would open your bulletin to the little article that Scott Richardson wrote many years ago. I'd like for us to read this <clears throat> by way of introduction. What I want to happen to you I also want to happen to myself, namely, that God the Holy Spirit would bring us down so low that we can't see a single good thing in us, and when we look inside our hearts, we could see nothing but that which would condemn us. Oh, that we would come to God as criminals in prison clothes with a rope around our neck and confess that we have nothing of our own but sin. Remember, God would have us to be real before him. Truth is, until we become nothing, Christ will not be everything. <clears throat> the message this morning is taken from Mark chapter 15. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 6. Now at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. There was a custom in Jerusalem that the Romans and the Jews had agreed upon that on the Passover, the Romans would release one prisoner back into the population, depending on who the Jews 
wanted. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had done unto them, as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Pilate wanted to release Christ. He wanted to. For he knew that the chief priest had delivered the Lord Jesus Christ for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I should do unto him whom you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to contend the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. What a beautiful picture of the gospel we see in the substitution of the Lord Jesus Christ taking Barabbas' place. Now, the scripture tells us that he was a notorious criminal. Scripture tells us that he was an insurrectionist. Scripture tells us that Barabbas was a murderer. And the scripture tells us that he was a robber or a thief. If God gives us grace to see ourselves as we are, we will identify ourselves with Barabbas. We will see that all of those things that Barabbas was guilty of, we're guilty of before God. And we will see that our need is for the Lord Jesus Christ to take our place. To take our place. That's exactly what happened Barabbas was the one that was supposed to be on that middle cross between the two thieves. Those were Barabbas' cohorts. He was the one that was to be crucified that day. And knowing that that was the day in which he was going, he knew what crucifixion meant. He knew the agony and the end of crucifixion. I don't know how brave he may have been in life, but I'm certain of this, that in the last hours of knowing that he was going to the cross, he was probably a very scared man, bound in a dungeon by chains to the floor. He heard, he heard the, the prison keeper, the guard, come down that cold, dark hall, clanging the keys, and convinced that this was the end for him, I can just imagine the feelings and the fears that were gripping his heart. And then to hear the door open and the guard come in and unhook and unchain the shackles and to walk him down the hallway and to get to the opening of the prison and say to him, you're free, you're free. Another has taken your place. Now that's salvation. That's salvation. You all know that I'm big on interpreting names because I think there's a lot of things to be understood in the scriptures when it comes to understanding names as we just saw with Simon's name meaning to hear. You know what Barabbas' name means. Bar in the Hebrew translated means son, son. Simon Bar Jonah, Simon son of John. And uh, when the Lord said that the Spirit of God will come and cause us to cry from our hearts when we pray, Abba, Father. And so Abba translated means Father. 
Barabbas' name translated means son of the father. Son of the father. And he represents every one of God's elect. He represents every child of God. I had people say to me, well, isn't everybody a child of God? No. No. God is every man's creator, and ultimately God will be every man's judge, but God is not every man's father. The scripture says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was made flesh and dwelt among us, he came to the Jews as a Jew, and they received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So apart from believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting him for all your salvation, you cannot claim God as your father. But if the Lord Jesus Christ is your elder brother, if he has taken your place on Calvary's cross, then you can say when the Lord, when the disciples asked the Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. What did the Lord say? When you pray, say, our Father, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come to God as a loving, compassionate, heavenly father. I had someone say to me one time, they said, well, you can't tell people that God's your father because what if they had a really bad example as a father and they may identify God with that? Actually, I think that person might have an advantage. Because the person who grew up, and it's a blessing to have a great father, but the person who grew up with a good father might be tempted to identify God with that man. That would be a problem. But perhaps the person who did not have such a good father has in their hearts and minds the image of a man who would love them and care for them and provide everything for them, unlike their earthly father. Truth is, if you had a good father, thank God for it. But your heavenly father is nothing like your earthly father. Nothing like him. Son of the father. When the Lord Jesus Christ prayed in John 17, he prayed to his father, Father. I pray. Turn, turn with me to that passage, John chapter 17. In our Lord's high priestly prayer, he, he mentions, he calls to the Father. On many, look at verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may Glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh. God the Father gave to his son power over all flesh. Now that's what you and I need. We need the power of God to put our flesh to death. To take up our cross. To look to the Lord Jesus Christ for all the hope of our salvation. We'll never have, we'll never have the ability to do that on our own. Now we have our Lord, our intercessor, praying to his Father. And uh, the amazing thing, it, when every time the Lord speaks to, he speaks to his Father, he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them unto babes. Even so, it seemed good in thy sight, Father. And then when he teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray, Our Father, Our Father. See, the only way we can claim God as our Father is to be united to the Son. He said, no man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Father but the Son. And them whom he reveals him. Show us the Father and it sufficeth us. 
Oh, <laughs> Philip, have you been with me so long that you don't know that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? For I and the Father are one. Everything that you and I are ever going to know about God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, we're going to discover it, have it revealed to us in the person of His Son. Barabbas represents every child of God in that He is the Son of the Father. The Son of the Father. Oh, we have a Father who provides everything for us. Everything. Now, the scripture also tells us something about Barabbas that every believer can identify with. And that is that he was an insurrectionist. Now, our form of government not only tolerates demonstrations against the government, but actually encourages it. I think it was Thomas Jefferson that said, dissent is the highest form of patriotism. And as Americans, we have, we have a mindset in our culture that makes us suspicious of governing authorities, makes us self-sufficient and in some degrees seditious to our government. We fire them and hire them every two to four years, don't we? And that's good. It's good. It's a good form of government, I think, because men are fallible. They need checks and balances to keep them true and faithful. But my friend, do not even entertain the thought of thinking that God needs to be checked and balanced. You see, faith, faith is in fact when God beats our swords into plowshares. When he beats our spears into pruning forks when he bridles us and causes us to bow and say with that Syrophoenician woman, truth, Lord, and worship him. You know what the opposite of rebellion is? A rebel spirit might be a healthy thing to some degree as a citizen of the United States of America, but it will do nothing but separate you from God. The opposite of rebellion is Worship. Worship. It's to bow before God and to confess your absolute total dependence upon him. To have no if, ands, or buts to say about what he says. <laughs> to say truth, Lord. Truth. Whatever you say is right. Lord, who am I? Who am I to question you? Who am I to do anything but bow in submission to you? <clears throat> I was talking to Angus Fisher this week, and uh, he'll be here in a couple weeks from Australia. I hope you all are praying for him and for Todd and for Chris. But uh, he, he brought out something. We preachers talk, we always talking about what we've been preaching or what we're going to preach or what scripture says. And he brought something I've never seen before. In, Matthew, in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, the scripture says, In that while we were yet sinners, Christ, or in that while we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. And he said, look up that word, ungodly. And I did. Because, you know, you think of someone who's ungodly as being, as being um, uh, irreligious and licentious and indulging themselves in all sorts of godless behavior. But that's not what that word ungodly means. 
When in the Greek language, if the, if the letter A is put before a word, it, it, is, it negates that word. And uh, the word ungodly in Romans 5, 6 is the word worship with the A in front of it. In other words, in that while we were yet without strength, Christ died for those who were incapable of worshiping him. (laughs) That's what God calls ungodly. Ungodly is not bowing in worship to him. And by nature, we all come into this world as Barabbases, insurrectionists, rebelling against God. I'll not have this man reign over me. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to have it my way. And if you want to tell me something that the Bible says, fine, but I'm going to, I'm going to question it. And maybe it'll work for me and maybe it won't. That's the nature of the natural man. And when the Lord delivers you from the prison of your rebellion, he causes you to turn from a rebel to a worshiper. And you just bow. Lord, I don't understand it all. I don't know what you're doing. It's not comfortable. I wish it was different. But Lord, I know whatever you do is right. And I know that you are occupying the highest throne that there is in all eternity. (laughs) And that you are ruling over all the inhabitants of the earth, over all the armies of heaven, that no man can stay thy hand and no one can sayest unto thou, what doest thou? Lord, you're just right. You're right. That's what worship is. Worship is bowing. It's bowing. And all this stuff that men do in religion, you know, if you read on in Mark, you find that the Roman soldiers mocked the Lord Jesus Christ. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They smote it with a reed. They put a purple robe on him. They bowed before him. They called him king. They spit upon him. They were mocking what he was claiming to be, the king of the Jews. And that is a perfect description of what happens in man-made religion. Men are mocking God. They pretend to worship him. But they don't believe that he's sovereign. The only God that you're going to worship, the only God that you're going to bow to is a God who's absolutely sovereign, a God who's omnipotent, a God who has conquered death, put away sin, risen from the dead, a God who rules and reigns from his throne on high. And they don't believe that. The natural man who's religious, who's feigning worship, who's mocking God, believes himself to be on the throne of God. He believes that God's subject to him. You listen to him. God loves everybody. God wants to save everybody. Christ died for everybody. God's done everything he can do. Now it's up to you. Man has put himself on the throne of God. He makes God dependent on him even for his sanctification. Well, you know, God's, God did all the saving, but now we've got to do our part in order to stay saved, in order to... <clears throat> here's, the, here's the glorious truth, brethren, is that God doesn't force his children into submission. One day, One day, the scripture says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the only way I can understand that is that God's going to take his rod of iron and smite the unbelievers on the back of the knee and force them to bow. But he doesn't do that now. 
You see, one day, every knee is going to bow. Every knee is going to worship. The ones who are made willing in the day of his power, the ones who see the Lord Jesus Christ as the only hope of their salvation, ruling and reigning at the right hand of the majesty on high and willingly bowing in worship and submission to him. No more spirit of insurrectionist with God in the heart of the child of God. The truth is that God loves us into a willing submission. Saul of Tarsus riding on his high horse, breathing out threatenings against God, was knocked off his high horse, wasn't he? A light shined from heaven. He found himself in the dirt. Lord, what would you have me to do? Was he resistant? <laughs> he called, first word out of his mouth was Lord. <laughs> Lord. The unbeliever doesn't worship they feign worship. They pretend to be worshiping. And the truth is, until the Lord Jesus Christ comes into the prison of our sin and delivers us as our substitute, we're just like Barabbas. We're just like Barabbas. We have an insurrectionist. We're ungodly. We're unable and unwilling to worship God. High treason, and it carries the death penalty. When Onesimus ran away from his master Philemon, he was an insurrectionist. He was a rebel. He was going to have it his way until he met up with the Apostle Paul in Rome and heard the gospel, and God broke him. God bridled him. And Paul was able to send Onesimus back to his master with a letter saying, receive him as a brother. Receive him as a brother. And if he owes you anything, put it to my charge. <laughs> There's substitution. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing. You see, being ungodly is not necessarily being outwardly licentious or profane or irreligious. It's just being destitute of a reverential awe toward God. It's being unable to worship. Scripture tells us that Barabbas, the son of the father, was a notable prisoner. Notable means notorious. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. He knew it. It wasn't any question in Barabbas' mind that he was a prisoner and that he was about to die. It was obvious. Actually, the word notable means to have a mark on you to be sentenced to death. All his appeals had been exhausted. There was an irrevocable sentence of death that had been passed down by the highest court. There was no, no place to escape. Notice in our text in, 15, in verse, chapter 15, verse 7, he laid bound. He laid bound. Now here's the, here's the voice of, a, of an unbeliever. I can quit anytime I want. I'm master of my own ship. I can control my needs and desires, and I, I've, I've got... I've got this under control. I'm, I'm, and the child of God says, Lord, I'm bound. I'm bound. I can't believe if you don't enable me to believe. 
I can't resist temptation if you don't lead me not into temptation. Lord, I'm without strength. I'm by nature ungodly. I'm completely dependent upon you. You see, the child of God knows beyond any shadow of a doubt that all his appeals have been exhausted. I, I'm sure that a prisoner in his early days in prison would be, would be looking for a way of escape. <laughs> Don't you know? That? I mean, they're rattling the bars in the windows, making sure there's not a loose one in there. You know, maybe there's, a, maybe there's some scratches in the wall where the previous prisoner has tried to make a hole to get out. You know, they're, they're, they're fi- trying to figure out every possible way to get out of prison. And when God makes you to be a notable prisoner, you come to realize there's no getting out of here. There's no escape. If the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't take my place on Calvary's cross, there's no way for me to get out. There's no way for me to appeal my charges. I'm hell deserving. And if God doesn't do something for me, I can't be saved. I can't be saved. Lord, you're going to have to do it all. You're going to have to do every bit of it. Barabbas. He was an insurrectionist. What about you? Unable to worship, ungodly, rebel, won't have God to reign over you. He knew that he was a prisoner. He knew he deserved what he was getting. Thirdly, the scripture says that Barabbas was a murderer. You say, well, I've never, people say, well, I've never murdered anybody. Well, listen to what the Lord said. He said, you have heard it said that if you, if you kill your brother, you're guilty of murder. But I say unto you that if you have aught in your heart without a cause, you're guilty of murder. You see, man looks at the outward appearance. God's looking at the heart. And when God looks at a man's heart... And he sees the animosity that he has towards another man. God says, you you just killed him. You murdered him. How many times in addition to what's in our hearts, we've murdered men with our slandering gossip, saying things about people we should never have said. That being put aside, The murder that you and I are guilty of is much worse than that. You see, a crime, a crime is judged in its severity by the importance of the person that it's committed against. You take the life of the president of the United States, and I guarantee you, you're going going to face the You might be able to get off if you take just a common person's life. But you see, the more important a person is, the more weight that crime holds. And God says in Zechariah, when the spirit of grace and supplication is poured out on the house of Israel and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced and they shall mourn after him as one mourneth after his only begotten son. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross, he was bearing the sins of all his Barabbases. And had you or I been the only one that was going to be saved, he would have had to do exactly what he did in order to save one than to save all. A holy substitute. God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There had to be a substitute in order for us to walk free, in order for them to come unlock the prison, in order for this son of the father to have his liberty the Lord Jesus Christ had to bear my sins. He bore all the shame of them. He bore the guilt of them. He he bore the penalty of them. 
and he put them away once and for all. The holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He's the one that we killed. And just like Barabbas, we are guilty before God as a murderer. The murderer of the worst type. Not only was he an insurrectionist, a rebel against God, not only was he a prisoner, not only was he a murderer, but the scripture says that he was a robber. He was a thief. Now there's something we all know something about. So I've never stole anything from anybody. Malachi asked it like this, will a man rob God? And then the people said, wherein have we robbed thee? In that you've taken from me tithes and offerings. You've robbed God. You've robbed God of, uh, of, of his ownership. That's the, I'm not preaching on tithes and offerings. I'm convinced that if a, if a man trusts the Lord Jesus Christ, truly trust him, for the forgiveness of their sins and for the salvation of their souls, they'll trust him with everything else. You trust him with the greater and you won't have any trouble trusting him with the lesser. But men rob God in that they don't trust him. They don't trust him. They rob him of his glory. They rob him of his righteousness when they try to present themselves before God based on something that they've done. They rob him of the dignity of his death on Calvary's cross when they try to atone for their sins by something that they do. They rob God. And just like Barabbas, we've all looked somewhere other than the Lord Jesus Christ for our righteousness and our justification, thus having robbed God of his glory. Barabbas. He had a substitute. He had one who died in his stead and presented himself on behalf of his crimes and of his guilt. Oh, the scripture's full of substitutes, isn't it? Don't you love it when God told Abraham, take thy son, thine only son whom thou lovest, and get thee up to Mount Moriah and offer him up as a sacrifice? And as Abraham and Isaac are walking up that mountain, Isaac says to his father, Father, here's the wood and here's the fire. Where's the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice for the burnt offering? And what did Abraham say to his son? God will provide himself a sacrifice. And that's exactly what God did. He provided himself a sacrifice. Abraham had to look behind him, didn't he? The scripture says, and Abraham looked, as Abraham had his, had his arm up with knife in hand, ready to be obedient to God, and take the life of his son, the Lord stopped him. Told him, Abraham, look behind you. Abraham looked over his shoulder and he found a ram caught in a thicket. And that's where we're going to have to look. We're going to have to look behind us, way behind us. We're going to have to look back 2,000 years. We're going to have to look back to eternity and see that the ram that was caught in a thicket is the Lord Jesus Christ who was slain before the foundation of the world. There's our substitute. There's our substitute. Barabbas had a substitute that day. We don't know anything else about Barabbas. Scripture doesn't tell us whether he became a believer or whether he went back to his insurrectionist, murderous, robbery life. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. But God put it in his word. <laughs> Jonah was a substitute, wasn't he? You remember when Jonah, the Lord told him to 
go down to Nineveh and preach uh, judgment against them and he went down to Joppa and then he went down into, a, into the, the ship and went and fell asleep fell asleep and the, and, the, and the sailors are caught in a storm and they all thought they were going to die and, 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 and they woke Jonah up and said care us not that we die <laughs> what a picture of the disciples and the Lord Jesus Christ on the sea of Galilee Lord don't you care that we're going to perish they drew lots, and it was discovered that the reason for the storm was Jonah. And what did Jonah say? Cast me into the sea. And as soon as he hit the water, just like the Lord when he silenced the wind and the waves on the Sea of Galilee, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey his voice. Yeah, and as soon as Jonah hit the water, the storm went away, and the sailors lived. And Jonah went into the tomb for three days and three nights. The gospel is a message of substitution in every way. You and I have to have a substitute. We're just like Barabbas. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the only substitute that God's satisfied with. And faith is looking to your substitute for all the hope of your salvation before God. And every son of the Father... Every Barabbas will do just that. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word and know oh, how we do hope that your Holy Spirit would bring to our hearts a conviction of sin and a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Number 168. Let's stand together. Thy 
I lost one bringing, bind my heart, O Lord, to Thee. While the streams of life are springing, blessing others, O oh, bless me.